You are now looped into the world of Bam. Do you remember 28th night of September or just earlier, a couple of months earlier when I also used to start episodes like that with my sultry voice? And if I had a network, that would be, that would be it. <laughs> it's like roll the tape. Also, I have two confessions to make. This is super serious episode. It's so serious. My first confession. Remember how I did like acid attacks, mini so super <laughs> exhilarating. That uber funny topic in life. Yeah. Thanks for tuning into that one, by the way. Like, I think it's already the most listened minisode. If if not, like, it probably will be. Just because minisodes don't get that much attention, because it's usually not just one case. But I guess people knew it is an important topic. And not many podcasts discover it. So, you know, if type acid attacks, it's easy to discover me. Wow. <laughs> My legacy is great. So you know how I mentioned, like, you know, I go and people don't ask me for ID when I buy booze for these sessions because I look old and I age like a, a white woman. Well, actually, last time I realized that nobody asked me for my ID because the cider I was drinking was alcohol-free. <laughs> and I was stripping the whole episode. It was all psychological. It was all psychological level. It, it was like as if I was 13 again. <laughs> you know, your parents are like, yeah, try this alcohol-free beer. And you're like, oh my god, like, I am tripping. Being drunk is the best. And they're like, yeah, it was alcohol-free. And then all of your dreams and hopes are broken. Well, this could go two ways from there, right? It could go this way. It could go the way that it has gone today, where I actually made sure that it has <laughs> that the cider has alcohol in it. Or yeah, it could have gone a different way, where I could have just continued to buy alcohol-free cider. But no, I don't conduct experiments on my own mind. I don't want to be like paranoid, thinking like I'm lying to myself. Because of course I'm always right. There is alcohol in alcohol-free cider. I'm telling you, listen, I'm not cheapy. I'm not 30. I know what alcohol feels like, okay? Okay, cool. Second confession. As you know, I was reading And Rules, Ted Bundy, and I'll Be Gone in the Dark by Michelle McNara. Second one, would definitely recommend. Everybody needs to read it. I cried in the end. Pat Oswald's commemoration to Michelle McNara is how I want to be remembered forever. That's it. You cannot top that. You cannot. Nobody can top that fucking commemoration, that outro to the book. But... Today I finished Andrew's uh, one on Ted Bundy and I just didn't like the book. It's not that I didn't like the writing or anything, it just didn't give me what I wanted, which was like the personal touch all the way throughout. It was a good book, don't get me wrong, like all of the stats, everything was there, but it was kind of like listening to somebody cover the case on a true crime podcast and I was like, well, yeah, I've already like done that. I feel she more focused on narrating like his story and what he has done rather than just being like, okay... This is where I was in those stories. I don't know, I just wanted, uh, because two of them worked like at this helpline call center. And I was like, well, why was that not prevalent there? Why are you not picking his brain? Or like, you know, why is the book not about like the conversations that you have had? And then like how it went from there, then your involvement from there. I don't know, I just wanted more. Yeah, I'm gonna be Rosa. I'm gonna, I'm done with this podcast just because of saying this. Because <laughs> that's like the book that everybody recommends. So, yeah. But today, you did not see this one coming. Uh, I I didn't see it coming until about two weeks ago when I heard another podcast cover it. I was like, why have I never done this? We're talking about death, baby. Well, actually, we're talking about near-death experiences, baby. Okay, make it catchy, make it catchy. Near-death experiences. Okay, why are we talking about this? Well, you might or might not know, but I am kind of uh, obsessed with death, hence this podcast, but in general. I think about it a lot. It probably stems from the fact that my great-grandmother is the person that I love the most in the family, that I bond with. And obviously she is old, she is elderly, so... I always been fascinated with, like, why doesn't she fear death? Like, at what point she stopped fearing for death? How did she go through death? Because, like, her daughter, my grandma died, and, like, her husband died, like, 30 years ago or something like this. How would I cope one day that she dies? And just in general, nobody teaches you about grief. So I think I mentioned this, so if I mentioned it, so as I don't actually remember mentioning every single, what I mentioned every single of the 38 episodes. November last year I went to do, to this silent meditation retreat. And there this woman introduced death contemplations. Which you can do whenever you can actually google it, it's kind of like when you lie down and you are at peace with whoever is dying, like you, you are at peace with yourself dying one day, it's just in general to like sort of make you connect you to death in some way and make it normalize it for yourself. 
Do they help? I find them fascinating. I think they do to a certain degree. I am more for the approach of like visualizing that somebody has died and coping, pre-coping in a way by just like crying myself to sleep. Yeah, <laughs> that's the one that I promise you does not help. But yeah, you, you make yourself cry to sleep. Yeah, it's a good thing to happen once every now and then. Will it help in the future? I don't know. Most probably not. Because grief is a bitch. So, having summarized my obsession with death, let's actually move on to the topic of the day. So everybody's familiar with like movies and series portraying near-death experiences. There's always like the tunnel, the white light. There's always the encounter with the long-dead relative that's now looking very much alive. And it's all about that person who like, don't leave me and them sort of saying like, yeah, it's not your time yet. And then you return and you're suddenly not dead, you're alive. Cool. Congratulations. So that's how I structured this episode actually as well. But we are going to talk about a specific case. But before we dive into that, let me actually just uh, tell you a bit about not um, near-death experience. What's to say not-death experience? It's called life, Maya. <laughs> so usually NDAs are triggered during singular life-threatening episode. And this is when your body is injured by blunt trauma, heart attack, asphyxia, or just like choking, or shock. And it's actually about 1 in 10 patients with cardiac arrest in a hospital that undergoes such an episode. Obviously, this goes against science, for example, because researchers assume that when your heart stops, it stops sending this vital blood to your brain, so your awareness should immediately end. At this point, you are clinically dead. However, as we also know from science, that can be irreversible and you can be brought back to life. I don't mean spiritually, I mean by defibrillators, right? Like those two little things that you put on your heart and then they shake you up from life. <laughs> by the way, I th- th- this is why you should not doubt yourself. I thought I knew the word, right? I was like, the defibrillator is the word. But then I was like, no, it can't be. It's like it stands for something else. So I have Googled the weirdest things into my Google search right now. I was like, no, you, this is why you should always trust yourself. I, go- <laughs> I Googled bringing from the dead shake machine, <laughs> shake hard hospitals. Somehow it, it came to that. And if I just Googled defibrillators, I, would, I wouldn't have wasted a couple of minutes. This is why I question everything. Stop, <laughs> Stop questioning your own thoughts. That contradicts itself. Okay, moving on back to the story. Jesus. Even though there is research on this, predominantly doctors dismiss it as hallucinations, and researchers kind of don't really delve into researching it in depth, because it is still viewed as something supernatural, or just outside the reach of scientific exploration. But there are still people that write books on it, so in particular Raymond Moody, who actually coined the term near-death experience in '75. Or this guy, Bruce McGrayson, who was one of the researchers, and he published the Handbook of Near-Death Experiences in 2009. And then I found in this article this paragraph, which is kind of like poetic in a way. So I kind of wanted to portray it for you in a similar way. So for the person undergoing a near-death experience, what you remember is as real as your mind would produce during like a normal waking. And then once the oxygen and the blood flow are restored, the brain like boots up and this narrative flow of experience will just resume. Imagine being completely present while clinically dead. You can hear and see everything around you, while at the same time you're connected to the dead. Your life after it can never be the same. Why do some people get to experience an NDE and the majority does not? This is the story of Pam Reynolds. Okay, I have just opened the actual alcoholic cider, and the difference in taste is obvious. I'm, I'm like three years old. <laughs> now, on to almost death. By the way, if you hear like NDEs ears or experiencers, that's what people who have experienced NDEs have been called. 
So Pam was from Atlanta, Georgia, and at the time that she has had her um, near-death experience, she was a singer and a songwriter, so she was in Virginia Beach, with her husband was promoting her new music, so was just promoting her new record. This was in 1991. Where were you? What were you doing? Were you even born? I was not. And was also most definitely not planned by my parents, <laughs> still to this day. Well, not now, because I crushed their hopes and dreams, but my mom was like, you were conceived on our anniversary. And I was like, okay, mom, do the simple math, I was conceived on Valentine's. <laughs> ruin them, ruin your parents' hopes and dreams. Okay, so Pam, yeah, in 91, she was living her best life, she was at Virginia Beach, enjoying her life. And she just ex- inexplicably forgot how to talk. Just picture how scary this is, especially if you're like a blabbermouth like me. If suddenly just, you know, during this recording, I just gave up and like I couldn't talk. I'd be scared shitless. And that would also be a challenge, because, you know, not that I'm not scared, but like shitless kind of implies that you can't shit if you're scared shitless. And I always have something to explore. Maya. 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 Question what you share with the public. They need to put gross TMI in dictionaries, because that's what I'm all about. So this is obviously in convenience, because she's like promoting her new record, but also it's worrying for her, because she said like herself, she had a big mouth, so she was never left like speechless or anything of that sort. So she rushed to get herself an MRI scan, and this scan revealed that she had an aneurysm on her brain. And luckily she discovered at this point, because this was already leaking and it was a ticking time bomb. So they get her immediately into surgery, and the surgeon has said, like, the best fix is what they call cardiac standstill. He describes it further that it's, like, as deep into comatose that you can be to still be alive. So at the beginning of the surgery, they shut her eyes and they put these molded speakers in her ears. And these speakers in particular are crucial because they have like this clicking sound. It's kind of like, you know, when the plane is taking off and this is allowing the surgeons to measure her brainstem activity. So this is when they know her brain is dead, they can leak and like drain out her blood and then get rid of this aneurysm. This is when I'm moving you into the tunnel. So what's true, what's not from what you see like on television? Pam said she found herself looking down at the operating table. She could see 20 people around the table, hear what they sounded like, and she could also hear the sound of like the drill. Well, she said it it sounded like a dentist drill, so the thing that they were using to operate on her. And she kind of looked and it was in the surgeon's hand. She even further said like it kind of looked like her electric toothbrush, for example. Then she notices a surgeon at her left groin, and she hears a female voice that says her arteries are too small. And Dr. Spetzer, so one of the people operating on her, tells that woman to use the other side, so to use the arteries on her other leg. Soon after this, they drop the temperature, so they lower her body temperature to 60 degrees. And it's about that time when she noticed a tunnel and a bright light. So at this point, she has flatlined completely, and the surgeons have drained blood out of her head. So technically, she should be clinically dead, or comatose, whatever you want to call it. So just to give you an idea, so it is the tunnel now. We're going to move on to her actually having conversations with her relatives. But according to surgeons and like people who are just suspicious of all of this, the skeptics... All of this activity should have shown on this monitor called electro and sep photogram, which would pick up on any electrical signals in the brainstem. Cool, so she's in the tunnel now. Now we're going to the relatives part. So during the NDE, she says she chatted with her dead grandmother and uncle, and that she has spoken to them saying like she doesn't want to return, but that they have basically like escorted her back into the operating room, or that's how like it felt to her. Now skeptics immediately attack this, and they call it anesthesia awareness, which is a fucking nightmare. And they say this anesthesia awareness thing affects roughly 1 in 1000 patients. So they're like, well, you could have heard something like before, you know, actually being completely flatlined, you know, then you could have deduced certain things from like seeing them in the operation room like that think that it's like, it looks like electric toothbrush. 
and she might have just like reconstructed some false memories because of all these details that, he, that she noticed before the operation. Now you're like, okay, cool, 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 but what about actually snapping out of it or what I call the pool, but what people who are actually into researching and is called life review. So this is your typical seeing your whole life before your eyes, just like in a flashback. So for this timing is important, so at around 11.25 this heart lung machine was turned off, the operating table was moved and then the blood was drained from her body. So this sack of the aneurysm which was now drained and empty was just easily removed as well. So again scientifically now the brainstem kind of began showing activity again because again her body is warmer, her blood is flowing like connecting to her brain. But like 35 minutes after that, so at noon, it became apparent that her heart just won't resume beating by warming her alone. So they had to use the defibrillator to shock her and shock the heart into starting. Again, clinically, she only returned to stable, completely alive condition at 2.10 p.m. And going back to Pam and what she was experiencing this time, remember she was talking to the relatives. So she kind of says that her relatives were feeding her in a way. They weren't doing it like through her mouth, like with food, but they were nourishing her with something. And she feels like during as this was happening clinically, that she was being nourished by, well, she says it's something sparkly, so sparkles is something that she gets as the image. And she recalls like the sensation of being nurtured and fed and being made strong. And as if this was like a family gathering, her grandma didn't take her back to the tunnel or just like even send her back or ask her to go. She just looked up at her. And then Pam expected the grandma to go back to life with her, if you want to say that way, but it was actually the uncle who would bring her like to the end of the tunnel. And she said everything was fine, like she actually wanted to go, she wanted to go back to life. But then, and this is super interesting, she went to like the end of it and then as if she was seeing her own body from like a completely different perspective and didn't want to get into it. She said it looked terrible, it looked like a train wreck. And it looked like what it was, dead. And as if coming through this trance, they were playing Hotel California. No? The, the Hotel California? Okay, don't sing. <laughs> and she remembers the particular line, you can check out anytime you like, but you can never leave. And that's when she regained consciousness again. Now one thing, and I've listened to her interview, I've listened to Tracy Morgan, the comedian, like his interview as well, because his life story is also super interesting. One common thing among experiencers is that they never live life the same way. And it's not just like, oh, I have experienced and now I'm consciously making all these changes. It's like they're more connected to the other world. They just seem more experienced. And everything is just based on like, what they have seen. You can see how it has completely influenced them and their decisions. Actually, just to prove this, like you can actually check Tracy Morgan's jokes before and after his accident and his NDEs. It's like a completely different person. It's not like, oh, my jokes are now based around the NDE. It is a lot of that as well. But it's also just like more profound way of looking at life. Like his jokes are kind of deeper in a way. So what Tracy said is that he now finds himself saying I love you to everybody, to strangers, to anybody he just doesn't care anymore. He doesn't like care about like what other people will say. That's how we're supposed to be as human beings. We're supposed to take care of each other. What we see sometimes down here on earth, there ain't no room for that up in heaven. As you can notice for both Tracy and Pam, this was a pleasant experience. Actually, just according to, well, the very few research papers that are out there, there's only 1% of people that come from NDE having unpleasant experience. Again, according to research, there are like seven teams that people will go through as short as their NDE process is or like as long as it is. So it's fear, seeing animals or plants, bright light, violence and persecution, deja vu, seeing family, and finally recalling events post-cardiac arrest. 
And now you're like, well, well, I can I can poke holes into like any of these stories you didn't tell me about, like them seeing any animals and plants, Maya. Yeah, I'll give you an unbiased thing. We'll go for f- whether it can be true. We'll go whether it can be false. Okay, I do these things so people open their minds a little bit and try to understand. Like, there's a bunch of people that have made these stories public. There's research into it. So, yeah, let's open our minds a little bit. Another thing that happens to people once they have experienced NDEs, sometimes there are certain side effects, such as heightened sensitivity to light, sound, certain chemicals, or just like with Tracy becoming more caring, more generous. Sometimes people even push that, so that's why I say side effects, because now they have trouble with like timekeeping and finances because they just want to care for everybody, want to help everybody, and they just feel this unconditional love for everyone. Okay, so now we're debating, right? Pick your side and let's let's see the arguments. Let's say these NDEs are true. Let, let's hear arguments for it. It was this cardiologist Michael Sabom who has researched NDEs and has written like a book, Light and Death, based on those. So he has taken like, Pam's account of events and has actually like confirmed kind of like this thing fact by fact. So things like conversations that she would definitely not be able to hear. How many doctors were in the room? 20 doctors in the room? Because, you know, people come in and out as, like, the operation goes. So this is something that, again, wouldn't be fixed, like, the beginning of the rep- operation, as well as, like, a few minutes in. Or it's something that you don't care about. You're like, yeah, how many surgeries? You're not, like, out there counting surgeons before the operation. The conversation about the veins in her left leg. The Hotel California is in particular. And then he also got the saw thing from the manufacturer and it did look like the electric toothbrush. Now you're like, okay, cool. Well, there's still senses, right? She could have heard it. Wrong. She couldn't have heard it because of what they put into her ears. Now, because I have a fish memory, I don't actually remember if I told you or this is going to be like a big reveal. What did they put into her ears, Maya? It's actually molded speakers. And these speakers are not just like any speakers, obviously, it's kind of like earbuds, but they're also used to kind of generate any stem cells, like any brain activity. So again, medically, people should be able to see if she can hear or she's flatlined and comatose and then proceed with the operation. Also, remember when I said the surgeons shut her eyes? They actually shut them, but they also tape the eyes, especially exactly so that they can see if there's any brain activity. Again, because they want you comatose to get rid of your aneurysm. So she couldn't even open her eyes, even if she wanted to see what was going on. Any physical sensory perception was just off the table. Also, I find this interesting because people, like, kind of when they attack something, they're like, well, these ear speakers, like, made clicking sound that was so loud It would feel like jet plane taking off, like it would be impossible to like even stand. And the way Pam described it is that she started to hear a noise and it was a natural D. Obviously she is the singer, songwriter, so she knows these kind of things. So she said, I don't know how to explain it other than to go ahead and say it. I popped up, (laughs) I popped up out the top of my head. And then Maya, the mature individual, put in the next line, she put the D in the NDE. What does that even mean? Why why is this comedy shit, Maya? Why is this nonsense? So those would be like the main arguments for the true. When it comes to untrue, there has been this anesthesiologist, Gerald Worley, who has done research and he is like the main, he's kind of like the sabom on like the untrue side. So he is convinced that the NDE occurred uh, while she was under the general anesthesia. Remember anesthesia awareness thing? He's like, no, this definitely happened while the brain was still active, and this is, explains everything. They taped her eyes, mate. So we're like, okay, cool. Okay, so they taped her eyes, but yeah, let's see neglect like that. What about the earphones? What about these earbuds things? He's like, well, they were not that tightly fitting, were they? Or it could be due to the sound transmission through the operating table itself. The operating table doesn't work like as a freaking speaker. What? So he says... This is probably other people's argument as well. Well, you know, she must have seen a saw, a bone saw like that before, and she just recognized it from the childhood, and, you know, then it just reminded her of, like, the electric toothbrush. 
He's like, listen, it's rare. This anesthesia awareness thing happens to one in every 2,000 operations. But here we are. It's such a rare thing, but it can definitely be clinically explained. Now that we have the true and untrue arguments, let's go a bit further into like general research. Obviously, with this kind of thing, you can't really like retest it. You can't just put people in coma and have them clinically dead for no reason. It's dangerous. So the only research that can really be done is asking people to relive their already done NDEs, which is again great if you do it like on the spot or, you know, it can be like memories from like years before. And again, when researching those people, I feel like this is the question which I had myself. I was like, well, of course, people who are actually more spiritual, more believing, like kind of like me, or just people who are, I don't know, super religious. And now this is their final connection to the God. That isn't as true in itself. It's more that the subjects like of the research who have had um, NDE, actually just lost their sense of the physical bodies and just kind of like merged with the spiritual and accepted the spiritual. Other research was done by Sam Parnia and this is <laughs> so fucking painful because they have actually analyzed 16% that they were able to like bring back from the dead. So basically they had a study of total of 2060 cardiac arrests. Out of those 330 survived, 140 were judged well enough to be interviewed, they agreed to participate, but then of those 140, 101 made it past the screening interview. Two of those remembered their out-of-body experience, and then of those two, one became ill, so they only interviewed one person in the end. So obviously skeptics kind of looking at this will be like, well, first of all, there ain't enough for your research or your point. But also it kind of goes to show like, why aren't more people then talking about it? How come here come like certain famous people talking about their near-death experience? Are they maybe just doing it for publicity, Maya? Maybe they have just invented it because, hey, they see this same portrayal in movies, in series, and they're just like, yeah, well, look at what happened to me. So with the samples that they have, they can't really do much. People have actually managed to finally study like 100 and the subjects and it was revealed that like any prior religious belief or just knowledge of NDEs, you know, knowledge of everything I'm talking to you about, so like the tunnel, the relatives, everything like you've seen in movies, didn't actually have like any particular effect on the likelihood of having one. It's like, there go my hopes and dreams. More findings are kind of available, or slightly more findings, when it comes to how it affects your life afterwards. Because obviously that's data that's easier to collect. So here subjects would gain self-confidence and would become more extroverted after this experience. Their general attitude towards life would change, so generally this would include like a sense of sudden purpose in life, appreciation of life, and just like an increase in compassion, patience, understanding, just overall feeling that you're suddenly actually strong and like awareness of your personal strength. And the religious part, like the religious feeling is actually more connected to the aftermath, so it's more than this like internal personal increase in religious and spiritual feelings exudes or like represents itself after you had the NDEs, even if you were not that kind of person before it. And finally, and this is probably the one where I'm like, just let, let me just have the NDE for no reason. Like, just, just comment always me, please. And that is that people who go through NDEs often find that they do not fear death after they do. And they just feel like this positive experience that's awaiting them when they actually die. So they make peace with it. Something I cannot do with that in general. Obviously here, I don't know if you guys have watched like Elon Musk thing and about robots and those fucking chips that they put into your brain. That's so Black Mirror-ish. But I mean, that's kind of like the research we need on these kind of topics in the same vein as well. Because like to conclude this, and these aren't as like spiritual, like supernatural, like you're thinking like alien abduction. Or just like seeing ghosts. That's something where you can't actually just... There's no like scientific way. You can't like measure their pulse. You can't prove that an alien fingerprint was on you. That kind of thing. 
Whereas here, people are actually connected to those gram things, to the machines, to monitors. Everything is technically monitored, but still, there is no valid scientific explanation for it. And we're just incapable of measuring every single process that they go through when comatose, which is actually number one scarier shit. But number two means you kind of need to believe in the spiritual, which actually makes me think a lot about, well, how do all of these movies have that kind of portrayal in the first place? You know, what came before? The chicken or the egg? <laughs> was it somebody that spilled the beans that had the NDE? Or was it that everybody somehow, if you are a skeptic, you think everybody got it from the movies and the series, and now they're just like pushing this as like their own personal agenda? Speaking of, that brings me to the motives. Yes, this is a short one. There's not as much information on this one, because again, people can't really research in depth into your brain what happens to your brain and your thoughts, yeah? That's why thoughts are powerful. Never underestimate your motherfucking thoughts. Okay, motives. Yes, you can say some people experience these ideas or they're gonna sell you the story that they do because of publicity. But I feel in certain things, like Tracy Morgan was super famous, probably actually more famous before his accident and his comedy was, I mean, subjectively funnier before it because now he just, you know, talks about this experience and embeds it into the comedy, which again doesn't really fly with everybody. You're like, okay, cool, now can we move on? But no, he can't move on. So I feel like there is a lot of like actually sharing the knowledge, sharing this connection with the spiritual. Plus when you physically can see the changes and like just in how people suddenly talk. I mean, that would be the effort to just pull something like that off. And now you're like, oh no, I'm actually this different person. I'm selling you this different agenda of mine. It's like, why, why would you suddenly push an effort? Like, then that should be scientifically explained like explained because then clearly something happened in your brain to make you suddenly what switch your personality so i think it's more like sharing the knowledge because as i mentioned like this can be a positive experience but it can also be negative but also you don't want to constantly relive it yourself unless you're actually just sharing the knowledge and like explaining to others how it works get what i mean because you're technically connecting to the dead so like if i was to connect to you know, whoever is dead and like how I was emotionally connected to them. Well, then I don't want to be out there every day giving interviews about how I suddenly reconnected again to this person that is dead and is not near me right now. I have, yes, seen them during the NDE, but it's done now. So this MD, a radiation oncologist in Louisiana, Jeffrey Long, has done some research and found that about 10% of people who have been clinically dead experience and then the E. And as to why this happens to some and not the others, he quoted this woman, this research subject, and he has asked her, and she said that when she asked God why her, he, well, God said, love falls on everyone equally. This is what you needed to live your life. And he says this particular thing kind of explains this experience and why some people have it and some don't. And it's kind of like that it comes from like the wisdom outside of yourself which would also explain why people have similar experiences but not identical ones and it's also interesting what they see and who they choose to interact with from like their past so when people are given a choice whether to continue with death or return to life they usually don't want to return and it's because of this afterlife realm and he says 75 to 80 percent basically feel intensely present so they feel a bunch of positive emotions in this near-death experience more so than they actually experience in earth like i mean even if you think about it it's kind of like heaven wise right it's only a couple of seconds you're just seeing the people that you loved from the past of course you're going to have just a positive experience it's not like you're stressing about your work or something you're seeing everything that matters in a way and that's why it's kind of like this unearthly realm and that's probably why people come out of it with like some different outlook on life as well because they see just how powerful it is and what really matters to them pretty much that's the case 
it's a short one but a sweet one what do you think about near-death experiences i like to keep my open i in general like to think about energy of the places rather than you know being like oh i believe in spirits i believe this place is haunted etc it's more like good or bad energy with me so i kind of feel like i believe that something like this can happen to people and how it can affect them just even from what i've seen as i mentioned just like youtube videos of like people before and after you're like damn even the way you talk is completely different but i'd like to know your thoughts you know debate me fight me on it because again there is a lot more to be done like for it to be medically explained and just in general more data to be gathered from the people that have experienced and these and maybe haven't spoken about them and like what reason they choose not to speak about them for either Okay, now, because this was very death heavy and probably not everybody's cup of tea, it's a light on the spot session. Do you remember 2015? If you hear some craziness outside, it's the wind. It's like the windiest day, the windiest Sunday of the year. What the fuck? So, 2015. I think this might have happened. No, no, no. No, 2015, definitely. It was a weird time, right? I mean, I would kind of argue every year is a bit weird on the internet, but uh, do you remember Charlie Charlie? <laughs> I have no idea how I came to this. Okay, so like for on the spot, I kind of looked at like Shane Dawson videos from like 2017 and 16 when he started on YouTube. I don't know, I don't watch Shane I don't know when he started on YouTube, okay? Shane Dawson fans, don't come for me, please. <laughs> Yeah, I love how you consider stuff in the same range with a guy that has like 20 plus millions <laughs> subscribers on YouTube, Maya. Okay, but then also, there's this blog that I would advise everybody to subscribe to if you like this kind of shit. It's called The Ghost in My Machine, and it's just like stories of the strange and unusual. And that's where I got the on the spot for the elevator game. So, Charlie Charlie. I had no idea about the origins of this freaking game. It's like completely Spanish. It actually... Remember how like it has those pens and then like the yeses and noes? Well, the whole game called Charlie Charlie Challenge came from Dominican Republic. And it was actually called Juego de la Lapicera or just like the pencil game. So why I didn't think that this had anything to do with Spanish? Because who the hell in Spain or just Latin America is called Charlie? Well, apparently the demons are. So there's this woman for BBC Mundo that said that there is no demon called Charlie in Mexico. So this is usually an American invention. They don't just call, you know, demons Carlos or like Carlitos. <laughs> because that would be the equivalent. And also just imagine how... Well, not that this challenge is not already lame. Let me just make that clear. But Carlitos, Carlitos challenge sounds a bit different. And apparently 2015 is not when this came to life, it's a much older game. Well, some of these language message boards dated from early 2000s and this Juego de la Lapicera kind of took some wing in like 2008, but it was only made popular, let's say, by the American teens in 2015. If you see different names, it's also referred to as the Marta game or La Martita. La Martita is the cutest. Cool. So you might be saying that uh, this game is purely gravity, but no, let me just uh, describe you the rules and how you play it. Instructions, let's go. So you need at least one individual. You need two pens or pencils, a sheet of paper, a ruler, which can be optional, and information you want to know. So like the knowledge you see, like questions that you might have about life or just in general, but they kind of need to be answerable by yes or no. What, what can go wrong? <laughs> so the instructions, right? Preparations, it says, begin at any time. You place that sheet of paper on the flat surface and orient it kind of like landscape. Then do the lines, so like as if it was a cross, and that's where you might want to use the ruler. So now this sheet of paper should be divided into the four squares, with the lines divided those squares into like four equals. Now in the upper left, you put the word yes. In the upper right corner, you put the word no. Then you place one pencil on the center of the page horizontally and the other one ver vertically. And when you are ready, you have a conversation with your paper. And then you people make fun of me for talking to myself. So, you speak aloud the words, Charlie, Charlie, may we play. Then you watch the pencils. Please watch those pencils carefully. Watch the point of the top pencil. So if the pencil remains still, then the ritual has failed. You failed. You didn't ask well enough. Your correspondent, this imaginary friend, is not present. 
you don't proceed. You pack up the pencils. You dispose of the piece of paper. You may try again another time, <laughs> it says here. If the pencil moves to say no, the ritual has succeeded, but your correspondent doesn't want to talk to you. Don't proceed, because he doesn't want to talk to you. You get it? Get it. You need to apologize, though. Remember, Charlie is a demon. You need to apologize for disturbing your correspondent and bid them farewell. Not just that, but you pack up those pencils, destroy that paper, dispose of everything. <laughs> dispose of the pencils as well, just dispose or burn it all to the ground. You may try another time, but proceed carefully. Now, obviously, if it wants to say yes, then the ritual has succeeded. Your correspondent and you can, can talk. Mm -hmm. You have an imaginary friend. You may proceed. Now, there's another option. If the pencil moves, but it lands on the line of the axis instead of the word or the quadrant, then, yes, Charlie is present, but it's uncertain if he wants to participate. So you may ask again until the pencil moves again to yes or no or just remain still. And then you proceed. You move the top pencil, so again, it's aligned to the vertical axis, so you move them again so they're aligned. Then you ask the next question, and that's how you go on, but you need to repeat the words Charlie, Charlie, and then ask your yes or no answerable question. So if the pen doesn't move to like yes or no, then the correspondent doesn't know, or has chosen not to answer, so you don't repeat the question. And then when you, you know, gathered all the knowledge that you wanted from this world, you proceed to the farewell. Mm, you need to say goodbye, like, it's, otherwise it's just rude. <laughs> to exit the game, you need to say, Charlie, Charlie, may we stop? Again, if the pencil doesn't move, you don't have the permission to end the game. Who do you think you are? Charlie owns your ass now. <laughs> if it moves to no, you can't exit the game. You need to ask again. If it moves to yes, then only then you can exit the game, so... <laughs> You better have some time on your fucking hands to play this game. That's what I gathered from this experience. <laughs> this is the best line. Once you have gained permission to exit the game, bid your correspondent farewell, pack up the pencils and put away the piece of paper. It's like, so now you can obviously dispose of them, but you can also store them because, you know, they're not cursed or whatever. But if you choose to store them, don't store them in the same place. Keep them separate. That doesn't say why. There's, there's no reasoning behind any of this. Oh, okay, it says there's no telling what your correspondent might get up to otherwise. What are they gonna do with a pair of pencils? I don't know. Fuck it. If you play it with multiple participants, you need to kind of alternate. So, like, not the same person shouldn't be asking questions, you know, two questions in a row. Again, why? Nobody knows. And you can also play it with, like, bystanders. It's just, you know, <laughs> if you want to watch somebody, like, make friends with an imaginary person, yeah, but bystanders should not intervene. Don't intervene if you're a bystander. You can also slightly vary certain things, so you know, like the introduction, you can sort of, you can also say, Charlie, Charlie, are you there? And then if it's yes, then you kind of can proceed. But yeah, you should not exit the game without the permission. <laughs> Again, <laughs> I don't know what happens to you if you do. You, you, If you have ever played this game, please tell me. Have you been haunted? Has something terrible actually happened to you if you left the game without the permission? And in a nutshell, that's it. But then I found an actual explanation behind this. Some people actually went <laughs> and wrote up on this Wikipedia page about an explanation. Like, how does this happen? What does it really mean? And you know I love me the wise. So there's this University of London researcher. He's called Chris French. He's the head of the anomalistic psychology. Sounds cool. Sounds dope. He says that people see patterns in random events like this and perceive the intelligence behind them. So often the answers in those divination games might be vague or ambiguous or just yes or no. But our ability to find meaning, even if it isn't there, then ensures you to like perceive the significance in those responses and to be convinced that there is some intelligence in some way behind them. It's kind of like when you, you know, I don't know, are super positive and you like super believe in yourself and then like something happens to you. That kind of thing, I think. Why am I trying to make this dumbass game deep? There's been research that like people kind of, it's kind of like watching paranormal or just like scary horror movies in groups versus yourself. Like you're more inclined to scream, you're more inclined to, 
you know, react to certain things because of that feeling of danger and like, oh my god, it's so spooky. But also it's because of the peer situation. You kind of want to be involved. You all want to be feeling the same thing. It's like the worst form of peer pressure. <laughs> so that's that. Do you believe that there is something supernatural happening? Or do you think it's just like somebody breathing more heavily or just gravity working its way? Because it's like one pencil on top of the other, right? Like, I mean exactly that it's like gravity one of them is inevitably gonna move somewhere but also what a waste of fucking time <laughs> that's my ultimate conclusion like how much time you need to this to ask for permission for this also i'm sorry but like all of these teenagers okay i understand every year is weird on the internet but there's this common sense that people especially teenagers right who would play this game because i certainly would not with my almost 28 year old ass would not play this game I don't have this time on my freaking hands, I need to record things in life. The teenagers, they are not gonna ask anybody for permission. They don't ask you as a, their friend for permission. They don't ask their parents for permission. But what, they're suddenly asking this random ass entity called Charlie for permission. I don't get that part. I'm sorry, but what, what's up, teenagers? Explain yourselves to me. And let me know, do you actually think there is something supernatural with it? Or are you just like, no, I just played it to belong. Because peer pressure is motherfucker. And now look at the time. You are going into your next Zoom call. <laughs> and it is probably a Zoom call because we are almost completely back to quarantine. At least that's how it's in the UK. You know what? I wonder, do you still do the check-ins with people? Do you still ask them how they are? You know, now that they might have gone to the office and now they're back home with their partners. Are they going insane? Kind of like me. I just had like a couple of days of liberty. And then now every day again, it's like, yep, the husband's still there. Still be roaming for three other days of the week. So... All day, every day, we grinding. Are you still asking people how they are and actually caring to like listen to the answer? Not just like, you know, doing that small talk where you hate when people actually answer to your question and you're like, yeah, yeah, moving on to this meeting. No, never forget the time when we used to fucking go for the toilet paper like it was the last day on earth. Those were your priorities for the last day on earth. And also how people actually used to care about the others on those days because it was all new. It was all the feeling of paranoia, the feeling of madness was all new and fresh. And we love new things. Well, this is somehow also a new thing. Yeah, it sounds old and it's like, well, we are back at it again. But it's different this time, isn't it? You have a different perspective. You know that you will either like it or hate it. You know what worked, what didn't. So it's again, it's a new thing. Can you discuss with those people what did work, what didn't? And then maybe implement something new in your life. Maybe this time you change offices and the other person works from the bed and you work from the office. That will never change, Kaket, so don't you even try me this time. I'm 90% of my days are spent in bed and that is how God planned it for me, okay? God planned my life. Why am I suddenly becoming religious? What is this episode even? Listen, I'm supposed to be in bed my whole life. <laughs> this is it my muscles might reach some atrophy stage but i don't care bed is my playground and my office okay that sounds sexual I'd edit that out <laughs> it doesn't sound sexual it sounds boring as hell why do you spend 90 percent of your time in your bed okay please somebody relate to me podbam at gmail.com or just hit me up on intercom <laughs> intercom well, just hit me up on Instagram or Twitter that damn pod. What is your playground? Let's share each other's playgrounds. And by playgrounds, I mean like your happy place. I don't mean sexually. I really don't mean it. <laughs> the place where magic happens. Okay, this episode is getting even weirder. Well, that was that. Near death experiences, better known as non death experiences, with the weirdest outro to date. So, <laughs> you know the drill. It's a Monday. Happy Monday. And until the next one, keep making this world a better place. One motive at a time. Bye, fuckers. Playground. 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 <laughs>